To the Into the Wilderness podcast. We're bringing you this one once again from the Iwa Outdoor Classic. We recorded this uh, a couple of weeks ago in Germany. But we're not at Iwa Outdoor Classics currently. No, currently we're sitting in the we're, Highlands. We're in a Bothy. Actually, my cousin's Ness. also sitting in the room because he lives uh, he lives in Inverness and he's just popped down to come and see us for a little bit, which has been very good of him. So he's only been here for two minutes and we told him you need to now be quiet for 15 minutes so we can record the If we brought another podcast. mic, he might have, we might have let him on the show. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Um, so, yeah, another great show we've got lined up for you today. It's uh, Daryl's going to be cor- uh, maybe correct me here. Does it start with Pedro? It starts with Pedro. It start- Pedro from Kuyu. If you don't know him, just Google Pedro Kuyu. Does and you will up? find him. It does. Oh, okay. I uh, know that. Because he is a man who posts a lot of awesome pictures of awesome adventures. It, it definitely check out his Instagram account. Yeah. I think that is Pedro. It is, yeah. So yeah, check that out. Um, the links, the the links, it will all be in the description. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, but that's not all we have. We have a a whole walk around of Iwa, uh, along with a conversation, a sit down conversation that Daryl did uh, with the guys at Bushnell, and I spoke to Mark Newton at the end of this podcast. Uh, about Rigby and the new Rigby rifle, amongst other amazing things that Rigby have been doing over the last yeah. two years. We talk about aim point as well. That's talked about. Uh, I don't know if anyone saw me playing uh, when I was doing some live videos on Instagram on the aim point stand, and it was a uh, VR headset shooting boar, and it was really, really cool. Because I missed out on Wherever this. you looked, and it was one of the best shooting experience cinema things that I've ever been on. I'm quite jealous yeah. that I didn't have. Time I wasn't to very do that. good though. <laughs> I was not very good. But I, I've never, I've never practiced. Did you before. get beaten by Lisa? No, she got sick. She got, she felt motion sick oh, playing really? it, so she had to stop. So I beat her. So you beat her by default. <laughs> <laughs> by default, yeah. We have a winner from the competition two weeks ago, which was to win that fantastic solar charging set. Uh, the Power Traveler, Power Monkey Charger set. And Daryl has the winner selected from uh, the Instagram and Facebook entrance. And email as well. Oh, and email. Uh, And it is Claire Tucker. Congratulations, Claire. Congratulations. So you get in contact with us, podcast at paceproductionsuk.com. It is also in the description. And yes, shoot us over an email and uh, we'll get it sent out to you. For anyone that is listening and thinking, I've won a competition, but I haven't got my prize yet. Me and Byron have been away. We've been extraordinarily busy. You will get your prizes. If if there is a delay in your prizes, it's because we are busy, but we will get around to it. We promise. It's uh we we haven't used them or sold them. No, no <laughs> they're, they're sitting they're, in the they're office. They're still in the office. It's just we have not had any time at all. Actually, uh, next week after this goes out, I think we're in the office most of the week. So hopefully, yeah. we'll get everything. So we'll have a today. shipment going out. Absolutely. Uh, I was going to mention chimpanzees. Oh yes. Quickly, we've had an incredible response. I've not actually added up the total since yesterday because uh, over a hundred pounds was donated yesterday uh, for the chimpanzee but we are well over halfway now to feeding and housing a chimpanzee for the year and if you want to be involved in that then just head over to the pacebrothers.com the shop look for the chimpanzee and you can donate there and if you want to know what i'm talking about listen to the ivan carter podcast which was two po- two podcasts ago you you can see it in the the title most recent ivan carter yep and uh, yeah, so thank you. We're going to read out every single person that donated because you've all done a champion job. Yeah, it's been the response has been quite incredible. Some very generous donations as Incredibly. well, but it, it doesn't matter how much you give, little or big, it doesn't make any odds. You've still done an awesome thing by donating money. Yeah, I've been really heartened by the response. So thank you so much to everybody. And if you haven't already, please go and check it out so you can see what we're talking about. We've posted a lot of stuff on social media about it as well. So there's plenty of things that you can read. And uh, it is a fantastic cause. And I'm really looking forward to being able to go back to Ivan and let him know that our podcast listeners, uh, hunters and non-hunters alike, have managed to raise the, the funds to house and feed a chimp for a year. We have a new competition, and the competition is to win a pair of Smith Optics uh, shooting glasses. 
we have a different way that you need to enter this way uh, the for this podcast, and it is an entry requirement which we haven't had before. Daryl, far yeah, away. So all we we've got slightly changed our Facebook page, and you can now leave reviews on it. I've never done that before. So basically, you just leave a review on our podcast into the wilderness Facebook page, and done. You're entered in the competition. Simple as that. Yeah, we'll pick it from the reviews. Now, we don't like leaving anybody out. So if you don't have Facebook, if you leave a review on iTunes uh, or whatever. Uh, Stitcher or whatever you Stitcher. want. Stitcher. iTunes listen. or Stitcher because we don't actually um, monitor the other ones that well. So preferably iTunes or Stitcher and we'll find you. And you can be entered. And I think that's it. Yep. I and think we're good to go. Don't forget that this uh, podcast is supported and brought to you by the Scottish Association for Country Sports. If you are not a member of a shooting or countryside organization, we uh, urge you to think about joining. Uh, They are the very people who work very hard in the background to make sure that we can continue to do the things that we enjoy doing. And importantly, it funds the greater good, uh, which obviously is something that uh, we we believe in and talk about on the podcast all the time uh, through various different conservation initiatives and uh, the conservation through the active management through hunting and fishing. Yep. I was going to add one more thing as well. We've had quite a few messages of people that are going to the Northern Shooting Show uh, that are going to meet us up, up with us there. So if you are thinking about going to the Northern Shooting Show, just do it. And Absolutely. Send us a message and then come say hello. You can still get uh, cheap um, tickets prior to the, the actual days as well. So yep. check them out online and we are going to be there and there's also going to be a live live podcast and debate on both days. More information on that to follow yep. along with the people who are going to be on the panel. Pedro, welcome to the Into the Wilderness podcast. Great to have you on. I know we were talking a couple of weeks ago. We've been wanting to get you actually on the show that we do back in Scotland, but we're here at Iwa. It's a perfect opportunity. We bumped into you. Yeah, thanks Thanks for having yeah. me. Pleasure. How have you found yeah. the show? Fine. It's. I mean, compared to the ones we have in Spain, this is a whole different level. <laughs> it's, a, it's a different you, level to yeah, what we you, normally have. <laughs> yeah, you miss the hunting part because there is no, no outfitters and all that. Yeah. That's the only thing I miss from, mm. from this, but for product and all that. Super interesting shows. Yeah. There's everything here. Now, yeah. I was going to no, say, no. whenever I see you online, you're the only man that I'm convinced hunts 365 <laughs> days of the year. I think you hunt 366 days. <laughs> that's, that's my goal, but actually, no. I wish I, I hunt. I mean, some of you, the pictures and the places and stuff you've been have been you know, incredible. It's especially, it, well, it certainly seems like in the last 12 months, a year and a half, it's just been like, wow. So just t- tell me your story. Well, how has that come about? Yeah, like... I'm a mechanical engineer. I used to work in an engineering company and all that. And and I ended up last early last year in March starting working full time for Kuyu. Yeah. So now I mean it's the dream job. Do the all the management and development of the brand in Europe. So that allows me to have a lot of time to to get outdoors. So <laughs> a lot of testing time. <laughs> yeah, a lot of testing. That's yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. hardest part. <laughs> and a lot of work. I mean people don't see the work and people think that I'm all the time but you learn to work everywhere. Yeah. So. T- tell me about the testing procedure that you guys go through, because I know just from hearing little snippets and reading stuff over the last couple of years, you really test your gear. Yeah, like everything that you see that we came out in the market probably has been testing for two or three years so, and all that. We only sell consumer direct, so that allows you to all the markups from dealers and middlemen and all that, and that's the main reason we are not here at the EVA. Mm-hmm. Uh, to invest it in better materials and do different things that companies cannot cannot do. Yeah. And also, the cool thing about that business model is that allows you to implement the changes as you go. So you don't have to come out with the new products for the Evo so, and you cannot modify them until next year. If we see something that we can change, some material that we can improve for a pocket or whatever, it changes directly. Yeah. So. So you might not necessarily release it as a new model. It's just that. Yeah, one, I mean, one, if one we see something like that this, we can improve, we, we improve it. You just change it. You don't have to tell all the different distribution <laughs> channels that you are going to change all the jackets that they have bought in, in yeah. January. and that Because then they'll be upset. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they will want the new one. So. Yeah. <laughs> and that allows us to use materials, uh, be with the developers that, and, mm. and develop the product. So, I mean, as Daryl said, most of the time when I see you on social media, you're you've got a bow in your hand you got, and you're you're off somewhere. What have been the highlights of your sort of last twelve months? Well, you've done some pretty cool stuff. 
Yes. Over so the all highlights. <laughs> oh, I mean, I, I like everything. I mean, I hunt with the bow, I hunt with the rifle, I hunt with my dogs, a shotgun, everything. I like everything. But cool trips. Uh, early this spring, I was in Azerbaijan mm. hunting the Dagestan tour. That was a pretty cool. Those mountains, the Caucasus mountains, are are beautiful. And I just came back in December from Cameroon. How yeah. was that? Yeah, beautiful. Northern part of Cameroon for Lord Derby Yeah. With the bow. Amazing and you, antelope. Huh? Yeah, an amazing hunt. Like, you have everything tracking, walking, beautiful animal, like, super cool hunt. And the, and the people over there, my main tracker was a bow hunter. I used to be a professional poacher with a bow for, for like 40 years. Yeah. So it was a cool experience to hunt with him. I know his procedures. Yeah. And, you must have uh, learned something from him. Yeah, I mean, that, that I'm a terrible hunter. That's, yeah. th- that's the main that's thing you learn. Like, freaking, I'm terrible, you know? <laughs> yeah. We were super stoked for shooting the Lord Derby with the, with the bow. And my PH and I were like hugging each other. We like, this, this is a big thing. And, and he came, so he's like, I don't want to blow your time, but I have shot seven with my longbow. Seven <laughs> with his longbow? Yeah, yeah. Um, with bows and arrows and all that. It's like, yeah. yeah, I know, but we are, we are white guys. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for us, this is a big thing. So wow. when you go away hunting, is it normally longer trips that you do? Two, three weeks at a time? I mean, in Spain, we have lots of opportunities. Yeah. So you can hunt in Spain three, 365 days a year. Yeah. So I hunt a lot. Every weekend, I, I typically go hunting, so... That's why probably it seems that I'm always hunting and typically try to make a couple, two or three trips mm-hmm. outside as yeah. much as, as I can. So. And what's, what's in store? What can you, where are you going next, I suppose, is the big question. I'm having a baby in May. So, <laughs> so now you've got to behave yourself. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to sell all my hunting gear now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm going in, in August to the Caucasus again, mm-hmm. to the Russian part for, for tour, the Cuban tour and Samoa. Oh wow! And then in September for the Yukon moose. Mm. So, oh, that'll be. Have you, have you ever hunted in the UK? Uh, no, UK Yukon. Uh, no, 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 I, no, oh, okay, okay, okay. But I'm saying, have you ever hunted in no, the UK? No, not yet. I was in the British shooting show, and I have a bunch of friends over there, and yeah. really want to to go, especially like Scotland and all that. Yeah. I, I haven't looked to European opportunities because we have the same animals in Spain, so I yeah, rather yeah. hunt them with my friends yeah, yeah. at home and in the areas that we have been seeing that stack for the last three years yeah. and all that. So. So but you, you but I'm looking forward to, to hunt in, in, in Europe and discover Europe because the stuff you guys do, it's amazing. And the places and, and it's real hunting. That's the kind of hunting I like. Mm-hmm. Well, we, we, can, we can give you a, an extreme of uh, compared to Spain if you want wet, <laughs> cold, uh, cold <laughs> and uh, miserable, mi- lots of yeah. midges eating you alive. We can provide that for you yeah. if you want a contrast. <laughs> yeah, perfect for testing equipment. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah, that's what it's all about. When you've been up in the mountains, I mean, the, the mountain ranges that you're uh, describing are as far from anywhere as any mountain range in the world. It's pretty extreme up there. What, what were the challenges that you found getting there with everything that you were trying to do? You know, you're taking pictures, you're capturing film, yeah, the, the you're weight, hunting. The, the weight is the main, the main problem. And documenting, trying to document the hunts, it's, yeah. it's terrible. I mean, mm. but... I don't know what, what to say. It's just you just if, get, if, get fitter so you can carry more weight. <laughs> <in. laughs> and I think that if you like what you're doing, it's not such a, there's no problems. I mean, it sucks sometimes that because it's you're tiring and all that. But if you like what you're doing, it's just... You, you have to remind yourself when you're walking up, like places like they're on the background here, you're in a lot of pain when you're going up sometimes. But you sometimes you have to stop and then you look around and then you go... Ah, especially you look back and it's like, oh, that was, that that was, was not bad. Here, I mean, yeah. you move way quicker in the mountains than, yeah. than what it looks and yeah. the amount of terrain you can cover in, in one hour, is, it's amazing. Mm. But when, when we were going up here, that was pretty miserable. For, for yeah. Byron, Byron is currently pointing to uh, a backdrop of uh, when we were filming in Norway. Yeah, if you watch this on YouTube, if you watch the YouTube video, yeah. you'll be able to see the backdrop that I'm pointing at. And it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was a long way up and we were carrying like... 40, 45 kilos. I think it was 1,600 meters from sea level, 1,600 meters up to up to where we are behind. But you know what? We look back on it now. It's freaking <laughs> awesome. Yeah, you forget. Yeah, I forget the you pain. forget about yeah, it, and you, you gone back. And I would like, probably oh. be stupid enough to do it again tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> because I've forgotten the pain now. Yeah, and the main thing is that you're never in good enough shape no, to hunt no, the mountains. Not. No matter how much you train, and, and especially I think like a lot of people don't train with a backpack with load. Yeah, they go running and they go, yeah. and it's completely different structure on your it body is, your, and muscle le- your muscles different muscles yeah. are working as well yeah. 
And uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. You can't, because when you come back from a trip, you are so fit, like mountain fit when you get you're where back. you should you, be when you start. Yeah, when you start. Yeah. yeah, like in day three, like day one is terrible. Day two, it's horrible. And day three, you are in so much pain that you are already like <laughs> going smooth and it's not that bad. So what do you yeah. do in the lead up? You know that you're going somewhere, you know, pretty serious. What's your kind of training regime? Do you ramp it up or do you have a pretty level that you, you do all the time if you have time to train very much? Yeah, like if I can go hunting, I would go hunting any day before instead of going training. But yeah. like I think uh, training with a backpack and load, that's the main thing. Because or just get up in the hills. Yeah, like I typically go in the hills with water on the backpack. When I get to the top, release the water. So you can walk down without the load on your yeah, on your legs. Your knees so you can yeah. and 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 train there because the walking with your boots, especially like people don't walk with their boots. Mm. I mean, if you go running, you need to be with your boots, the angles. Then you are all the time bending your your ankles, the legs, the weight, and all that. I think that's the the main training that you have to do. So when when I can, I. Well, I like exactly. There's a massive weight difference between your running trainers and your boots as well. Yeah, 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 Victor. And you know, actually, before we went to Norway, I actually was running for a couple of weeks before in my boots that I was going to hunt in. Oh, yeah. I just, I just ran in them, up, up the hills because I, well, one, they were brand new and I wanted to break them in and make sure yeah, I was yeah. going to sore feet. <laughs> no, but that's, secondly, that's an important just, thing. Just train. So it feels horrible. I mean, who runs in boots that are, you know, just below you? Well, like, I guess that's why the military do it. Yeah. Do all their, train. their, their training in the. It the feels boots. horrible if you go to the gym with your camo backpack and your <laughs> boots. And like, everyone, like, <laughs> everyone giving you a Who's funny that freak? Look? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like, and, and also like having a, I think, a backpack with a frame that in Europe is not something very common. Oh, in, that the, transmit, in the UK, it's very uncommon. Yeah, you don't that really see it. You need to transmit all the load to your hips. You need to be carrying the load on your hips, and that's what f the frames gives you. It's stiff enough to transmit all that load to your legs. So you're not carrying any load up here. Okay, yeah. Because when you carry it up here, your whole body, your muscles are working, and on the other side, if you're carrying on the hips, your, your legs are the ones working. So yeah. that bigger makes a... Bigger muscles. Yeah, like it makes a whole difference, I think. So. It's been awesome to have you on. This has been very short because I know you've got to go and there's a whole yeah, array yeah, of things to do today. But yeah. we will have you on for an extended period of time for our listeners because I'm sure they'll definitely want to hear. we got stories we want to bring. Yeah, we want to <laughs> get the story. Well, we, we, we need to hunt together. Yeah, yeah we could do a podcast while we're hunting. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. Solution. That's, you have just convinced me. Oh, yeah. done. So, yeah, we, so we just have to set a date. Some of the most popular pod well, one of the most popular podcasts Spiron did was when they were moose hunting in northern Sweden. Oh, yeah. People mm -hmm. loved listening to... Of uh, the atmosphere and the creaking cabin and uh, and and when we whenever we speak with David, David CP, that's uh, yeah, that's I, always a popular one. I think that's that's probably because you know him. Yeah. So you you are able to pull the most interesting yeah. things yeah. of of David out. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it it that's does it does thing. help it does help a lot. Help, so. so yeah, so we need to hunt together yeah. first so we can know you a bit better, and then we'll do the podcast because then yes. it'll be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> but look, yeah. Patrick, thanks a lot. Thank you, Rash. Thanks, thanks for, very much for yeah, coming on. Yeah. Cheers. Justin, welcome to uh, the Into the Wilderness podcast. Uh, really cool to have you on. Now, Cryptek, which is a clothing brand, but a lot of people who listen to this podcast, based in the UK particularly, probably have never heard of you. So give me a little bit of the background, where you guys have come from, and it's a very unusual... I've seen the pattern before, but it's, it's not like other things on the market. Yeah, so we, we started as a clothing brand. Um, the uh, the co-founders, Josh Clegghorn and Butch Whiting, were ex, um, they're ex-military now. They were Apache attack helicopter pilots. And, you know, when they were, when they were overseas and fighting our nation's battles, they, um, they came up with this idea on how to get into the hunting industry because every year that they missed a hunting season, they just really thought about it more and more. And when they got out of the military, they wanted to make sure that, you know, they, they, they found a passion that they could chase. And that, so they got into the hunting world and they started to build uh, Cryptek, the clothing brand. And, you know, after the the first year release, the the solicitation from the, the U.S. Department of Defense came out for a new family of camouflage, and so Josh and Butch came up with this idea to create to create this new camouflage pattern that's you know one of the most effective camouflage patterns ever invented, and they took the idea of World War II camo netting mm -hmm. and the micro macro layering pattern and the distorted hexagons to create this two dimensional feel or three-dimensional fill in a 2D object. Okay. And so you see the blur and the definition in the pattern, and, and so it's really hard to focus. And so 
Um, the U.S. Department of Defense tested this program. We got shortlisted down to the final four, and then they shelved the program. But you know, the, the pattern itself was is very effective and was was you know developed for the end user. It was actually designed at 400 meters forward. So so it's got amazing shelf appeal. I mean, we have you know all these amazing experiences with people that use it in hunting and the military, but also has this really great shelf appeal. And it wasn't designed for shelf appeal. It was was actually for function. Desi- for function. Mm. Yeah. It was was actually designed you know to actually use it but it's just got a great shelf appeal as well so so it's a company that started its life as a pattern yep but obviously you're now you've now put this on clothing so yep. maybe you can tell me a little bit about the clothing that you have and what its applications are for different types of hunting so we have we have a couple different lanes that we developed for um we started obviously in the hunting market by itself you know that's where we really started we once we pulled the the solicitation out of the military, we took ours commercial. We were the only one out of the four that took it commercial into the hunting market. And so we have everything, you know, our, our tagline's battlefield to back country. And so we took a lot of the ideas of clothing in the military and brought them into the hunting world because they correlate, you know, the, the knee pads and, and, you know, as you're stocking and some of the adjustable waist features as you're layering up and down. And so it just correlated right into um, the hunting market. And so we have a full line of base layers with merino wool. We also do synthetics all the way up to extreme cold weather gear and everything in between. We also have 11 different patterns. So we have a pattern for every environment, urban environments, high alpine environments, you know, forest environments. Um, The three patterns that were tested um, by the U.S. Department of Defense were Nomad, which is an arid desert pattern, Highlander, which is a transitional pattern up to 70% of the earth, and then Mandrake, which is a forest pattern or jungle pattern. So we covered the three. We also have, you know, a snow pattern called Yeti. Um, And then we launched a new line this year at Dallas Safari Club, um, with shoulder fabric out of Switzerland. The, the line we actually, the pattern's called Altitude, but we call it the Altitude Series. And so as we, you know, evolved our brand and involved our clothing to be extreme backcountry hunting, um, we wanted to find the very best. We wanted to find the best fabrics that we could find. We wanted to find the best performing fabrics we could find. And then also we wanted to do some some wet printing technology um, where a lot of the hunting industry is all done with heat transfer paper. We went with a wet print nylon at a shoulder, and it's our, our really high-end upper-tier piece for for those sheep hunters and above tree line high alpine type hunting. Mm. Oh, amazing, and it, yeah, you're right. It, you know, I've seen uh, the adverts in some of the American magazines that I get uh, yeah. over in the UK, and visually, just what you were saying earlier, visually, it's like whoa. And all <laughs> your your advert was pretty smart because it didn't really tell you very much about it. It just had the the pattern or whatever it was, and then Cryptech. And I thought, like, yep. well, what, what's the story here? What's the deal? What, are, what what are these guys? And it's only now seeing you here that I've actually got to put my hands on it and actually see what what in fact the deal is. <laughs> yeah, we spend a lot of time in R and D and test our stuff. Um, you know, around the world. You know, not only hunting but the tactical piece um we actually are getting more and more and more into the tactical world um with developing our own line of tactical gear um from tip of spear on down we have a tactical program right now for le and and uh you know it's it's done really well and then we've we've got some even bigger programs that we're working on so we're constantly evolving um you know we have a great we have a great market um, you know, we, we, like I said, we have the, the hunting side and the tactical side, and then we have this whole lifestyle piece that we've never even looked at that we have all this interest in. So, mm. And we also license, you know, we're very strategic on how we license. We license certain companies to bring products out. Um, like I see, you know, so here, license the pattern itself. Yep, just yeah. the pattern itself. Mm. Like, you know, you see Bowtech here. You know, <clears throat> they're one of our big archery um, licensees, and, uh, you know, I see them here at the show. And so as you walk around the show, you start to see some of the companies, backpack companies and boot companies. La Sportiva um, has a really great boot that they brought out this year, the Trango GTX Cube in, in Highlander patterns. So, you know, it, the, the expanse of the market as we've evolved has continued to grow. And in uh, in Europe, how do you how do you get your hands on it if you want it as a hunter? Are you distributors or are you online? How does so it work? So right now we right now we're working on our distribution into Europe. We have uh, some distribution areas you can jump online check them out. But you know we have we distribute into Russia. Um, we also have a little bit into Europe. We're working on with some companies um, to get a bigger collection here. Mm-hmm. Um, you can buy it direct from us and have it shipped but we're working on a distribution where it's factory direct to the you know the distribution centers here in europe and around the world brilliant look it's been an absolute pleasure to to speak to you and yeah uh, 
a very a very sexy new brand, you know, just from the visual perspective. And I can see and hear from the conversation that we've had that it has a, a, a great history to how it's evolved. Yeah, we've definitely had a lot of fun with this. You know, we're it's you know really growing extremely fast, and this has been a great show. We've been here for a couple of years now, and you know we appreciate you stopping by the booth and checking out the products. Really, just thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Ian, welcome to the Into the Wilderness podcast. Thank you. Thanks for joining us here at the the Ewa show. It's uh, it's our first year here, but the, you are you are certainly not an Ewa virgin. How's it how is it going this year? Yeah, it's it's incredible. I think this is my 18th year. 18th visiting, yeah. Wow. So, which is um, yeah, it's impressive. So you're like a granddad of the Ewa. Uh, apparently so. Yeah, <laughs> it feels that way. You know, we've seen a lot of changes over the years. Um, but certainly for the first time in about three or four years, we're feeling a lot of um, you know, good vibes. You know, business is good. A lot of our partners are saying they're doing very well. Mm-hmm. Um, despite the issues with Brexit, changes in the economy in the US, everybody seems very buoyant. So I know it seems to be a, a great show. Uh, tell me a little bit about the Realtree brand and how, how that works. I mean, a lot of people will see Realtree you know, and the patterns everywhere but maybe not quite understand how Realtree actually works. Even my phone, my old phone case had Realtree pattern on the back of it. Yeah, so it is everywhere. <laughs> well, well, Realtree, obviously, it's a, it's a camouflage pattern. It's been designed yeah. uh, to break up your outline in the field to provide effectiveness and, uh, and cover for when you're hunting. But, of course, it means so much more than that. Realtree is a way of identifying with other people who enjoy the outdoors, who enjoy hunting. Uh, and it's something you can do when you're not hunting, as you say. Your iPhone cases, swimwear, watches, just about every type of lifestyle product is now available. Toilet seats, and, I think I even yep, said. You know, <laughs> <laughs> there are no depths to which we won't say. <laughs> and what on the on the clothing side, um, that, I mean, that's what a lot of people will associate Realtree with. What What is new? What, what, what is new for this year, 2017, that we're seeing clothing side? And, and you can even extend it across the other things that you're involved in. Well, uh, uh, we have uh, several different patterns. Um, Realtree Extra is our main camouflage pattern at the moment. Realtree is a licensing brand, so of course we don't make anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, what we do is we create the patterns that then our partners use to apply mm-hmm. to their products. Yeah. Uh, so there are a huge amount of new innovations. As technology and garments improves, our partners then make more technologically yeah. advanced garments. Mm-hmm. Guys like yourselves that are getting out of tree stands, that are getting out into the field, that are going up into the mountains, they demand something different from their clothing than they did before. It used to be we'd sit in a tree stand in minus 10 and wait for a rowboat to come to us. So you need to be warm. <laughs> yeah, now the next generation don't want that. They want to get out. They want technical, functional clothing that breathes, that provides them with a insulating layer. And then they want to get out and they want to enjoy their hunting. So a lot of our partners are now making what, what I would describe as almost sports gear mm. for active hunters. And, um, you know, trailblazers like yourselves yeah. are the reason that these tastes are changing. Mm. And you've uh, you obviously got a partnership with Vaughan and we're on yeah. the Vaughan stand here. That's on their backpack. Have you had a chance to use it yourself? Yeah, they sent a couple through. And... Um, you know, this this is, you know, one of the points I'm making is that they're identifying that there is a huge demand for functionality, for innovation. We don't need to use an old row sack in Loden with a few leather straps. That this this product it allows you to access your rifle really quickly. It's got great storage space. It fits comfortably. It's a perfectly customizable fit. It's made for an active hunter that wants to get out there and get to where his game is. So now we're very proud to be working with the market leaders when yeah. it comes to shooting and hunting innovation. Mm. And you personally, have you got anything exciting uh, yeah, lined well, up this year? Uh, we, we've Cause got you, you're known for, you have been known in the past for, you know, certainly hunting around the globe. Yeah, you know, I've got, I've got, a, I've got a passion for hunting. Um, actually, a lot of my hunting has been at home with, with an air gun or, or pest shooting, pigeon control, those sorts of things, as we all cut our teeth on. That's what we really enjoy. How most people start as well, air gun shooting. And, uh, yeah, but I stayed there a lot of the time <laughs> as well. I love it. Of course you, know. you did, yeah. yeah. So it's uh, air gunning for me or, or shooting with, a, with an air rifle is, is a huge passion. Mind. It's what's taught me patience. Yeah. It's what's taught me field craft and skills. Uh, my original Model Seven, but uh, Model Fifty air rifle was only about I don't know eight or nine foot pounds. So you need to be taking shots 10, 12 yards away from <laughs> your quarry, which means that you've got to get close. The amount of conversations we've had with air gunners, exactly what you just said, patience and it and teaches you a lot of the skills, the skills hunter, that you it? need. It, of course, and it teaches you to accept failure <laughs> and to continuously improve your skills. Yeah. Uh, and that rabbit or that pigeon or you know some of my bags that have come home with are just two animals. They just mean so much more. And everything that I learn is applicable to my big game hunting um, passion. Uh, But of course, as time progresses and these new avenues open up to us, then it's great to be able to get out in the wilderness as as you guys have found and and really earn um, those trophies and earn those experiences. And most of of my memories aren't from shooting big trophy animals. They're great stories. They're 
overcoming the environment, they're outsmarting an animal in its own environment. And, you know, for maybe, you know, six or seven hundred kilos of meat, if you harvest a moose. So that everything that I've learned has been applicable right the way throughout my career. And going back to your original question, what yeah, am I doing where are you next? Going to be going? <laughs> Well, I've, I've tried not to take a, set, a, a back seat, but certainly look very carefully at what we want to do in terms of creating some filming. Of course, I've been enjoying my hunting, but off the camera, uh, which has been great, so I don't have to worry too much about taking care of a cameraman yeah. and making sure he survives the experience. Um, but we're going to be going back out to uh, Canada looking at bear hunting. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're going to be creating a series of films about um, field sports in the UK, so by season by season, what we can do, not average hunters, but what we'd normally do so in April Roebuck season opens and through into June following how it changes throughout the year absolutely and uh, because there's a great compelling story there Mm -hmm. and there's a lot of value that we can add back to people who want to get involved in shooting and hunting and and shooting sports and and there are easy ways to get into it without having to spend a fortune and as you guys are seeing now right on your back door there's a huge adventurous landscape out Mm, there that can be enjoyed so and uh, how how have you seen because you know you've been involved in the industry for a long time how have you seen the shifts outside the industry to the, how the general public view hunting? I mean, it's something that we discuss quite a lot on the podcast and what we can do as a hunting community, what, what more we can do to try and um, embrace the fact that we have to communicate with these people just to show them what we do and actually why it's a good thing. And how have you seen that well, change over the 20 it's, years? It's the interesting thing you say, they. That, that's always been the issue is this division and between us, us yeah. and them and I think it's, it's, it's starting to blur significantly and I think access to digital media the quality of digital media and the way that we can communicate uh, it's good and bad so I think we just need to be um, undertaking best practice throughout we need to be very thoughtful about what we do how it can be um, seen by the they mm-hmm. and then welcome them in and I think nobody as long as you have the right intention so we're harvesting game from a natural source it's had a natural lifestyle and it's a holistic approach to selecting game we're not just shooting the biggest and and biggest horns and and just killing for for the sake of killing uh, that there is a process to that and there's a reason behind it and i think sometimes those messages have been mixed up and it's very easy to take excerpts of certain digital media streams Mm -hmm. piece them together and create a very compelling argument against hunting Mm -hmm. but equally i think that works the other way around as well and, and some of the, the content you guys have been producing really does show that that it isn't just about squeezing the trigger yeah. it's about filming mountain hares on a beautiful Scottish landscape and some of those spectacular scenery and that we are custodians of the countryside and yeah. custodians of our environment um, so yeah I think it's just doing what we do doing it well and, trying and to do making it sure those messages are passed yeah. on in a very understandable and clear way yeah. no no we, we, we couldn't agree more and I think as individual hunters, we need just we also need to realise that the modern hunter also needs to make sure that he has the arguments to defend what he does. Because if you don't actually have the arguments to defend and and the, you know reasoned arguments, you know backed up with uh, things that can be proven, backed up with science, then you should probably have a hard think uh, about why you're doing what you're doing. Because if you don't know the reasons really why you're doing, and you can't at least have a, a level-headed discussion with somebody who's maybe against it. You probably need to go back and have a look at that before you carry on doing what you're doing because you really should know those reasons. I I totally agree. And all of the dialogue out there has made me sit down and think, well, actually, I can see that point. I can understand where they're coming from and I can see how they've arrived at that that, that opinion. Mm, mm. Um, Now, sometimes an argument isn't going to help. A a charged environment trying to challenge somebody's perception of something is very difficult. Sometimes you'll never change. Of course. Especially online. Yeah. Yeah. Don't we all know? The keyboard warriors, we love them. We absolutely <laughs> love them. But one, one thing certainly we found through uh, Team Wild is we've, we've done some stuff which can be potentially seen as controversial over the years. Uh, but the dialogue that that creates, and eventually, if you, if you look through, some of, these, some of these threads go on for hundreds and thousands of comments, that actually towards the end of it, you start to see a consensus forming. And, and it, the more people that are involved in that discussion and that dialogue, the, the healthier it is. But as you say, you're never going to change people's minds sometimes. Sometimes they're fixed, and that's just the way it is. But if you go back to best practice, you go back to doing the right thing and what you truly believe in, then over a period of time, that becomes the norm. Yeah. Yeah. And just to, uh, just to wrap up, because I know we've all got a million meetings <laughs> every day, what's caught your eye here? Outside of the real tree stuff, obviously. What, what has caught your eye and you thought, wow, that, you know, that's different? Because we, we see a lot of stuff coming out throughout the year, but it's these early parts, SHOT Show, Evo, where we're seeing new launches. Is there anything in particular? 
there are it's, it's difficult for me to name names without picking up particular brands so yeah. we've got to be a little bit careful there are some amazing innovations in optics this mm -hmm. year yeah. that I've seen um, some a little bit heavy but in terms of pulling down what is a very sophisticated optical package into a smaller more compact yeah. chassis mm -hmm. for somebody like me that likes to get out there likes to climb that likes to reduce as much weight as possible uh, I think finally they start that some of the European optics manufacturers starting to understand that yeah there is a new generation of hunter coming weight weight is important is, <laughs> is a significant part yeah. and a major decision as to our, our purchasing choices so I think over in Hall 3A where some of the larger European brands yep. are there's, there's, there's some, some pretty cool places there are some yeah. incredible pretty good. cool things come out this some year some cool sure. stands as well yeah <laughs> so there's some big stands uh, Ian it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on yep, thank, thank you very you. much for your time you're very welcome okay, thanks Paul from Polycase Ammunition thank you very much for joining us on the Into the Wilderness podcast um, I've seen your stuff maybe a year ago in some of the American magazines that I get uh, and have been intrigued by the technology. So just start off by telling me what you guys do. Let's start with Thank that. Thank you very much, Byron. I appreciate that. Uh, what we do at Polycase Ammunition is manufacture a polymer-based ammo or components. And primarily what we are manufacturing right now is these polymer copper matrix ammunition. Uh, it's a projectile that is non-expanding and is formed through injection molding and uh, what it does, specifically this ARX profile, which is the design that you see here, is it is designed to be a replacement for hollow point ammunition. Okay, so it has the same effect. It has the same terminal effect as that hollow point, but the difference is, number one, we're able to maintain a round nose profile. So for feeding, it's ultimate. Uh, it'll feed through any type of uh, firearm. And the second thing is it's non-expanding. So unlike a hollow point that has to mushroom or expand, yeah. uh, go through that uh, mechanical uh, uh, operation in order to fully function, mm -hmm. we don't have to do that. What we do is we actually uh, penetrate into the target and then the flutes on this bullet will actually capture tissue mm -hmm. and uh, expel the tissue after constriction at one and a half to two times the velocity of the speed of the bullet. And that's how you get your terminal cavity. That's exactly where we get the terminal for, cavity. For the people uh, that can't see the see us because they're listening, um, it's uh, give them an idea. It's a spiral shaped uh, bullet head. That, that's the, yeah, so you've got like three uh, th three curves on yeah, the on Three, three curves grooves, on the, basically, yeah. that's right. To give you a picture at home. Yeah. It, it's, it is, it's uh, think of like a boat propeller yeah. that's, yeah. that's carved into the the uh, tip of the bullet. Yeah. And, and what about the technology and the actual material itself? Because we all know, uh, you know if we do any, any shooting, that putting, uh, getting something like this with the correct weight is, is difficult and also the, the correct integrity. Right. So uh, we are, just as an uh, FYI, we are a SAMI uh, uh, mm -hmm. member or associate member. And we do manufacture all of the bullets to meet the dimensional uh, specifications, characteristics and sure. specifications. Uh, we're working on CIP right now. Okay. Uh, but uh, what's very unique about this ammunition is it's a polymer copper matrix. Mm -hmm. So lead free. So it's great for hunting in uh, certain countries more than others. Uh, that yeah, there's, well, a, there's some, some of them you can't hunt with. That's uh, exactly like, right. I know there's some districts in Germany which are now lead free. Yeah. That's exactly right. And some parts of the U.S. is uh, exactly the same uh, issue. Uh, but anyway, it's a polymer copper matrix. And what that means is we have a much lower specific gravity or lower weight mm -hmm. than uh, traditional or conventional ammunition. We make up for that weight loss through velocity. Okay. So, we, of course, to create impulse with the firearm, uh, we have to uh, raise the uh, raise the pressures in some cases. Mm -hmm. um, so we can still stay within standard, what's considered standard pressures, but we're on the upper end of those standard pressures, and then uh, create generate the velocity. For example, the nine millimeter uh, has a velocity of one thousand five hundred and forty-five feet per second which is considerably higher, almost a, just over a third faster than conventional 9mm okay. ammunition. And just to go back to the actual, uh, the actual construction of the bullet right. itself, just uh, I, I want to understand how it's, how it's formed. I think sure. people would be interested to know that. So we use an injection molding process. 
literally the copper is blended into is it like a powder or? It, it is well we take powdered copper mm-hmm. yeah. it's then compounded into polymer okay. so nylon yeah and after the compounding process we receive pellets at our plant uh, tiny little pellets yeah. we put in then in our standard injection molding equipment and then that's where our proprietary process takes okay, over yeah. Uh, so you'd have to kill us to tell well, us Well, no, that. not really. I mean, we, uh, for anyone who knows, uh, has a basic knowledge on injection molding, I mean, we have two sides of a mold that clamp together. Uh, and then we push this slurry, mm-hmm. which is very, very th- uh, thick, obviously. It's kind of like, uh, imagine cold molasses. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is very, very difficult stuff to work with. But we push that into the mold. And before you know it, we have 32 bullets. Wow. What, what kind of um, price do they sit on the market compared to your conventional lead bullets? Okay, so that's the, I think, u- most unique thing uh, that retailers are finding yeah. about the ammunition is typically when you think lead-free, you think high cost. And that's not the case with this ammunition because it's we have such an efficient manufacturing process yeah. uh, and also a, uh, this proprietary uh polymer copper matrix uh, it allows us to not only manufacture the ammunition for a very competitive price but also then sell it at retail at prices that folks are used to paying in other words um, if I were to ex- to uh, compare the ammunition our, the sale price of our ammunition to some of the US brands mm-hmm. uh, I would say Hornady critical duty uh, a federal go- spear gold dot, mm-hmm. yeah. federal HST. Isn't that kind yeah, of so? Uh, so it's so in it that same price. Exactly, it's same. competing head to head against conventional yeah. hollow point ammunition. Mm. And on the hunting side, what what hunting opportunities are there with with a bullet like this? Okay, so our we have concentrated mostly on big bore hunting cartridges, mm-hmm. uh, and that's those are typically cartridges that we're not finding a whole lot of over in uh, over here in Europe. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah. So 458 SOCOM, 50 Beowulf, mm-hmm. uh, 45 Colt may be one that mm-hmm. uh, you can find over here. But we also now are venturing into the 300 Blackout. Of course. Now, uh, yes. Everyone's talking exactly. about 300 Blackout. <laughs> and this is a uh, quite a interesting cartridge. Um, this bullet is actually flying at uh, 2,550 feet per second. So it's got... The terminal uh, effect of that bullet is very, very what's interesting. What's the weight? It's only 90 grains. 90 grains. So it's quite light. Yeah. But uh, it's 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 got great terminal performance. Um, we'll also be turning that into a 308, uh, probably a 30 out six. And what you'll actually load it in a. That's in a that's oh, correct. Right, yes, okay. yes. In the same weight, in 90 grains. Yes, exactly. Oh wow. Yeah. Okay, now that is interesting. And. The, this one that I'm looking at here, this is non-expanding, is it? That's not expanding, okay. correct. But will you have um, flutes in this, the same? for the There will thing? be a fluted version, correct. Yeah. Now, the version that you're holding there is actually part of our sport uh, utility ammo line. And the sport utility line is developed very precisely t- for range use. Mm-hmm. Now, close quarter combat type of training yeah. scenario. Yeah. Uh, it's excellent for use within urban environments, for right. example, also. And... Uh, We've got an entire line of that sport utility ammo yeah. also that uh, includes 380, 940, 45, uh, 38 special, 357 mag. That's it. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward uh, to getting my hands on it. As soon as you said 308, I yeah. can see Byron's yes, eyes. I, yeah, yeah, I did too. <laughs> yeah. Um, and just lastly, the effect on the barrel and barrel wear, how does that compare? Well, I'm glad you brought that point up, Byron. Um, this is very easy on barrel. Uh, that was my guess. We're yeah. talking polymer and copper. Mm. So they're not abrasive. So and even though you're having to ramp up the velocity, you're not seeing, I mean, we all know that if, you, if you ramp fouling. up the velocity, there's a lot of problems associated with it. That's that. exactly right. And we're not finding those issues whatsoever. As a matter of fact, these bullets are what we call self-cleaning. Mm. So every bullet that, that is fired is cleaning any residue that's left, left yeah. over from the previous bullet and not leaving fouling in the barrel. Amazing. So folks are... We, we've been selling this ammunition primarily in the United States uh, for the last two years. Uh, we exported to countries on four continents last year, including the UK. Um, and 
uh, the feedback has been phenomenal. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's intriguing. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's a technology which seems to have sort of pushed it to the next step. And we've all seen yes. uh, you know, non-lead ammunition yeah. that's been on the go for a, a long time. But this is, this is something a bit different. Right. Well, it's non-lead and we're able to make it affordable. Yeah. I'm, uh, yeah, I actually, I'm looking forward to trying some on the range. Oh, yeah, so I, there, was, there was another question actually I was going to ask you sure. that, that, that had just slipped my mind there. And I'm assuming the answer is going to be fantastic. But <laughs> I have to ask, how does the uh, accuracy obviously is a, is a big point, especially when you're talking about you know, for hunting applications through a rifle. We're talking 308, 3006. Everyone right. knows what they expect to see from their 308. How does it compare? Uh, I, I will, quite frankly, the... 300 blackout, for example, uh, has got about a three-inch um, shot group at 100 yards. Okay. So it's in line with other conventional uh, 300 blackouts. We expect to have slightly better uh, accuracy with the 308. Mm -hmm. That said, that's one thing about this material. It is, although it allows us to have amazing accuracy at shorter ranges, mm -hmm. say 50 yards yeah. and in, the longer ranges, there's still some yeah. uh, elements that we have to overcome. But I, I, I guess that'll be something that'll come with, with That's time. Exactly and you guys right. will be working yes. on that. Yeah, we'll, we won't stop. <laughs> no, That's absolutely right. intriguing. Uh, it's, uh, it, it certainly seems like a, another step, another step in, in another direction away from something which we've something seen for a long we'll time. Start seeing more of yeah. in the next few years. Yeah, yeah. It'll be great, but well, you'll certainly see more of it from us. Yeah, yeah. I promise you that. <laughs> That's brilliant. Look, thank you so much for your time. Thank uh, you. Fascinating appreciate conversation. it, Byron. Thank you so much, Daryl. Okay, I appreciate the invitation. Uh, Maxim, thank you for joining us on yeah. the show today. Um, can you just explain who you are and where we are right now? So I'm Maxim Delon, working for Vista Outdoor in Europe, uh, most precisely on optics and electronics for the brands Bushnell and Tesco. Uh, we're based in Suren, just uh, just outside of Paris okay, yeah. in France, where the European headquarters is based. And uh, yeah, I'll walk you through the, uh, the new okay. product. Well, uh, you've got some real nice uh, trophy cams behind us right now, and we'll run th uh, through a few of those because uh, there's one in particular that I'm very interested in. I'm sure some of our listeners uh, will be as well. So if you just run through the range and what they what they can do, that'd be good. Yeah. So Bushnell, pretty much, I would say that's uh, six or seven years ago. All trail cameras were still very big on the market mm -hmm. and so it was the time where you would use the 4D batteries and and it's uh, it's been improving every year uh, since. Uh, Bushnell has always been a, 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 the, the biggest name in trail cameras on the yep. market um, and this year so we have the the wireless that you've just talked about briefly yep. um, and, and a whole new range of uh, what we call the trophy cam aggressors, yeah. which are our best sellers in the range. And they've been, um, they've been revamped for this year and uh, we're expecting to, to hit the sales big because we're bringing, um, we're bringing uh, features that we've not seen in, uh, in the trail camera market so far. Okay, would you be able to run over, it? well we'll start with the, the wireless one, the features of that okay. one. Because that's very interesting uh, for people w where we are from in very remote locations where it might take a bit of time to go and get their uh, camera. So basically, the wireless is a, a normal trail camera. It does whatever uh, a trail cam, uh, whatever all the trail, all the, the other trail cameras are doing. Uh, the idea is indeed to be able to uh, collect your pictures. Um, without having to go back to your camera. Um, so this being said, our wireless uh, trail camera, the Trophy Cam Wireless, is able to send either through MMS, so GSM network, yeah. or through um, email, uh, that would be GPRS and data. Yeah. Uh, I know that in England, uh, Ireland, Northern Ireland, uh, you guys are not using MMS so much because they get pretty expensive. Whether in France, for yeah. instance, we get unlimited MMS for free. Yeah. So French user will tend to do more MMS, uh, and UK user will be more towards email. Email, yeah. So um, the the the, um, the wireless trophy cam will just detect any heat or movement, like any trail camera, and then it will take it uh, about 
40 to 50 seconds, depending on the resolution you've set up mm -hmm. and the, the strength of the network. Yeah. It will transmit within a minute, you will get the pictures after the movement has been detected. Yeah. Um, you can set up all different of, uh, of uh, different features inside. What's uh, interesting and what's unique on the market for the wireless is that since we're working on so many countries, uh, the wire our wireless is now designed to work only with one carrier yep. in one country. Um, so you can you can just buy a SIM card, yeah, get a number, and put it in, and, put it in. Um, and you don't have to. You no longer have to go through um, setting up, uh, knowing the IP of your operator, the yeah. port you're using, whether you have to use SSL security or not. Uh, this has been uh, preset for you in the device. So you just select. It's, it's plug and play. Yeah, <laughs> you put your SIM card. You select your country. And you would do, for instance, England, and then I don't remember the carrier that might be T-Mobile or Vodafone. No, Vodafone, yeah. You select Vodafone. You put a number if you want to do MMS. You put email. Um, if you want to do email, it's it, there are two more, two or three more steps to to set up because you have to create a email account for your trophy yep. cam. Um, but it's fairly easy because all the the settings for the operators are in the device. And then you have a second um, features to it is that. We're also offering a solution online uh, with a dedicated website where you can uh, set up your trophy cam also from. So you log you log into it and then you, you log see in all and you pictures. set it up and then you save on your SD card. You put your SD card in the unit. And it sends video as well, depending on your strength of signal, does it? Or no, it, it, just it won't send video. If you are in video mode, it will just send you the first caption okay, yep. of the video, so you know there is something happening. But what's the the battery life on this? So battery life, if you just shut out completely the wireless mode, yep. it's just like other trophy cams, so up to nine months. Yep. Uh, this is calculated on the basis of 30 picture uh, per day plus 30 picture per yeah. night. Um, it's still quite a long time. <laughs> yeah. Of course, if you do video with uh, yeah. high LED settings, it yeah. will be shorter. Uh, and then if we are talking here in the wireless mode, so you have two possibilities in wireless. It will be either um, up to four months or up to two months in length with the same number of pictures okay, transmitted. Yeah. Uh, so the two different modes are what we call wake, where the, um, the trophy cam will remain connected to the network all the time. Okay. Um, this will obviously uh, take up more battery. Uh, the good thing in this mode is that while you send your SMS command to the camera, you will um, it will uh, proce uh, process them, proceed them automatically within a minute. Yep. Whereas the other mode is better if you want to keep more battery life. It's called Eco. And every time it will transmit an image, after the transmission is uh, done, it will shut off the modem again. And every new um, movement yep. will put the modem back on. And uh Will it let you know if the batteries run low or not? Will yeah, so you? Uh, you have uh, like thresholds yeah. when you get your pictures. And if you're going uh, below a certain amount of battery or below a certain amount of uh, card space, yeah. it will just below the picture, it will indicate uh, what's left of your battery and SD card. Brilliant. So a very useful trophy cam for, yeah. for people, especially around where we are, like I said before. Um, that in some locations it would take them a, a long time to get to where they're going to be. And and we sell them uh, for for two main usage. So indeed, it will, it's a great tool to 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 know the the games on your on your uh, on your plays yeah. and to 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 try to pattern the movement um, if you're a hunter. And but uh, on you just said it's also a good way to to keep an eye on on that trail that goes into your estate and yeah, yeah. there is no CCTV camera because there is no power available. Yeah, yeah. Um, you just have it there and you can see if anyone is coming in to go poaching. <laughs> or a very good application. Yeah. Um, so moving on to some optics. You've got um, some new optics. Would you be able to run through some of them for us? Uh, so on optics, we... At the end of um, 2016, so roughly around November, December, we launched uh, the, the Trophy Extreme line and, and Trophy line. So 
Uh, it's a family that was existing um, in the Bushnell company. Um, what is most interesting for us today is um, Trophy Extreme that will come in uh, different configurations. So 25 to 10 by 44, 624 by 50, 25 to 15 by 50. Uh, and they will have um, they will have multi x uh, multi x sorry uh, reticle as a basis. Yep. But then you can also have them as what we call um, DOA. Uh, DOA stands for uh, Denon Accurate. Um, this will be a reticle who is inspired by um, kind of like the the pine tree reticle from the military. Yep. So where you get windage and all the uh, compensation in the reticle. Um, so you get them in, in three different, so we call them all our 800, 600, and, uh, and 300. Um, and they are existing also in illuminated versions. Okay, yeah. So you will just have to, to check on the website to, to know the compensation for different calibers. Yeah. But it's, it's uh, basically all the calibers we're usually using in Europe are good to go. Yeah. Um, what, what kind of uh, price do these normally retail at? Where do they sit in the market? Oh, most of them will be below uh, between uh, 280, uh, 290 and up to 400, depending on okay, yeah. reticles. Well, that's, well, that's a uh, pr pretty good place in the market then. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, below the elite level at, uh, at Bushnell. Yeah. Uh, but it still has... Um, so uh, full-team multi-coated optics, it has rain guard too, so this is a special coating on the outside of our lenses okay, to, yeah. so water and uh, like moisture, uh, fog, yeah. moisture replant. Yeah. Um, um, it has side parallax adjustment, if you want to go on the shooting range a longer distance, you can. We, we will be, uh, for the listeners, we will be putting... Uh, pictures are as well that people can access and have a look at all of uh, the stuff and the, the optics as well because it's uh, well worth uh, checking out as well um, now moving on to range finders yes um, would you be able to tell us about your range yeah so the range finder Bushnell is a, is a family we, we love because um, Bushnell Bushnell pretty much invented the, the range finder application for for hunting and what is very interesting is that um, rangefinder today is either hunting or golf. <laughs> uh, golf being a bigger business than hunting, obviously. Really? Yes. Yeah. But it was invented by hunters. That yeah. uh, in the U.S. they they were hunters and golfers, and and um, so they first used it to, for hunting, and um, and then. Some guys just took their hunting rifles uh, or laser range finder to to their golf so the golf course, and then they noticed that it was also working on a on a pin. So they they developed a whole uh, a whole range for for golf too. Um, so the new product this year is more uh, dedicated towards tactical shooting and long distance okay, shooting. Yeah. It's called the the Elite One Mile Connex. The whole idea is that. It's for long distance shooting and you can pair it with either a Kestrel device for wind and all yep. kind of information and also to your smartphone. So, um, and and the, the whole idea of what it does is every, um, every settings that you usually do inside the um, laser range finder you can do on your app. On the app. And every measurement that you would get uh, from the laser range finder is automatically transmitted to your app and you can see all the correction or any kind of correction you can see for the distance you're targeting uh, obviously in yards, meter, MOA, mil, yeah. centimeters, angle uh, you can calibrate and put your either pre uh, preset calibers or you can do your customs if you do your own reloading yeah. Um, so it's it's a great tool. It do the math for you if you're uh, if you're into uh, shooting at mid to long distance. Hmm. Um, depending on countries, this, this will be allowed or not for yeah. hunting. And then we naturally we have all the rest of the hunting range on uh, laser rangefinder. Um, main feature I would say is 
Uh, so it's more mid-range, but it will still be able to give you distance up to a mile or, m or more. Yeah. Um, main fitters are they all come with um, uh, bullseye and brush mode. This this will um, in a hunting situation this will help you to um, to um, to target. Let's say a deer is passing in front of a forest and you yeah. don't want the background so you target everything and you will just isolate the deer and not the background so you're sure you're taking the good measurement. Oh wow, okay. But you have the other way around where if it's a deer, you have a stag behind some uh, brush, yeah. you're able to take the second target, so oh, the okay, stag yeah. and not yeah. the brush in front of it. And then you have a very specific application, uh, especially for uh, bow hunting. Yeah. I don't know if bow hunting is uh, allowed. Well, it's not legal in the UK, not legal but, in but the we, UK. we have listeners all over the, the world. We've got a okay. lot of American listeners as well, so, so more, uh, more interesting for them. So we have a dedicated product for bow hunting, which is uh, well big in the US, obviously, yeah. uh, which is also growing in France and in some countries in Europe, um, where, uh, where inside the reticle, there will be your normal reticle to get the distance and um, according to the setup of your bow it will add a point at the highest flight of your arrow mm -hmm. inside the reticle so you know that uh, if you're shooting at uh, 25 meter but you have brush overhanging yep. and you don't want your arrow to end up in the branch then you know if you're taking the shot or not. Uh, oh, on trophy cam. So we have, uh, uh, apart from the wireless, which we which we talked, we have the new uh, trophy cam aggressor yep. this year. Um, and as we were discussing, I mentioned this. Um, the new thing on this is especially on video. We are introducing what we call dynamic video. Uh, so for now, today, all, tra all trail cameras, actually, uh, whatever the manufacturer. Uh, the video you have to set an amount of seconds that you want, yeah. which means that the video will record this, let's say, 30 seconds. Um, so if a stag comes in front of the camera yeah. and stay five seconds, you still have a, a 30 seconds, and that means 25 Wait, seconds wasted. of nothing. Yeah. So it takes up cart, uh, space and battery. Yeah. So now we have dynamic and the captors, <coughs> the sensor will be um, activated all throughout the the action. Yeah. I would say, and when the animal or the, the person goes away, the it video it stops. It turns off straight away. Yep. That's a, a pretty good feature. It's a good uh, feature, is especially since now you can go up to two minutes in maximum length, whereas yeah. for now most trader cam will stop at one minute. That's and uh, is that roughly the same battery life? And it's nine months. Yeah. Nine months. So it will be yeah, on the Agatha line. It will not transmit. But it's for a different usage. Yeah, yeah, it is definitely. Well, thank you very much for uh, your time. We are currently on the Aimpoint stand, and we're here with Christopher. Christopher, you're going to sort of walk us through what the latest products from Aimpoint are. What what is it that we're standing in front of here? Yes, the the latest product is a new version of the micro model. We call it the micro S1. Uh, it's a micro model that is adapted more to to shotguns and mounting on the rib. Okay. Uh, we added the, the, the new, a, a bigger dot size. Uh, the intensity of the dot is brighter because many times when they shoot with a shotgun, they have a brighter background. You need extra sharp dot and, and a brighter dot. Um, the mounting solution for the rib brings the, the optical axis from the top of the rib to the center of the optical axis up to 14 millimeters. So it's a very low mounted site, optical site for the shotgun. There is very, that is very important when you want, want to have the... Mm. So this the basically is going to take, it's going to replace looking along the rib to your front deed? Not replace, I would say when the gun doesn't fit you properly mm. or you're shooting from an awkward position. I mean, in the winter time, you have a thicker clothing, you have a thick jacket on, the gun doesn't fit you properly. When you mount the gun incorrect, the parallax free red dot will help you point the right mm. direction. And where do you see the main sort of application of this being? I would say uh, for new hunters as a reference with a red dot, where do where do I have the red dot when I pull the trigger? Did I hit red dot as a reference on the shooting, uh, on the clay targets? I would say for the guys going from a blind up to shoot the goose when it's cold weather, awkward position, the gun doesn't fit, 
they use the dot as a re as a aiming point okay. instead because uh, they don't get the head in the right position to shoot along the rib. So it should hopefully make you shoot better. Yes, that's the idea. I would say this side doesn't help the the shooter who's always on the clay target or, or, or practice on the clay target. But those who don't spend the time to the fit difference. the gun to their body, that don't practice, these will help these guys who don't have the time for that. And what about in the rifle line? What is it? What have you got? Uh, maybe new or what the, the newest stuff in the rifle line is that you could talk about? On the rifle line, I mean, we have the basic fun function in all our models. Mm -hmm. Uh, the last micro versions is of course the most popular one. It's uh, it's more it's smaller. It's more practical to always have with you as a complement to the right to, to the traditional rifle scope. Mm -hmm. uh, the opposite uh, um, from the micro line micro line we have the Hunter series and the Hunter series uh, is more comfortable because it has a bigger um, bigger view through the sights. Mm -hmm. so it's a, more open than the other one, but of course it's bigger. So it's then then it's only individual which one you choose: mm -hmm. small, compact, more practical one, or the more comfortable uh, Hunter series. And just finally, for those people who maybe don't know Aimpoint as a brand, yep. but are used to a rifle scope in the normal yep. format yep. that we're used to, just explain to me why this might be a choice for you. Uh, with a traditional rifle scope, you have to have the eye in the right position. It takes a lot of time for the eye to get in the right position, adapt to the magnification, focus on the crosshair and on the target. What we do with the aim point side, you shoot with both eyes open, you focus on the target, and uh, the, the dot is always going to show where you're going to hit. So if you have a quick situation, bring the gun up and you don't end up with the right eye in the right position, the dot is going to show, tell you where you're going to hit. Mm -hmm. So you'll be faster on the target, it's more natural, with both eyes open, and focus at one point. The, does, the eye doesn't need any time to adapt, it's so natural to get on quicker target, target acquisition, acquisition and uh, you shoot quick, better so, and quicker. So for fast shooting, fast acquisition shooting, on target, definitely, it's, definitely. It's really Rifle scope is always good when you have the time mm -hmm. to adjust the magnification, to get the eye to adjust do the magnification and, and, and focus on the target. This is for fast shooting. That's really impressive. Thank you very much for your time. No problem. We are on the bench main stand with Derek. Derek, thanks very much for joining us today on the podcast. No problem. You've got a whole array of knives here. We do. Maybe grab one or two, which are some of the new things that you have, and oh, just talk man. me through it. All if right. that's possible to yeah. just grab one or two. Yeah. Well, I'm going to show you probably one of my favorite ones from this That's just because you like flicking around. <laughs> <laughs> I do. It's a, it's a battle song, so obviously, for those on the podcast, you can't hear, see it, but uh, you can hear the click and the clack, the very distinguishing sounds of a ballet uh, going back and forth. But um, it is our 30th anniversary this year. At, um, started in 1987, and it all started with a butterfly knife or a ballet song. So, so that's where it came from, and hence your hence logo. Hence the butterfly as our okay. logo. So 30 years later, we kind of uh, reintroduced a brand new ballet. Now, we've been making ballets throughout the years, but this one is truly a step forward in the technology of, in, in terms of a, a knife. Okay. So feature, it features two uh, solid single piece billet titanium handles. So that means they're all one piece. Each handle independently is one piece uh, and is held together. And basically there's a blade sandwich in there uh, and it takes a long time to mill solid titanium. We'll just give you an idea. <laughs> it's hard. It's about 45 minutes to an hour to make one handle. That's one handle. One side of a handle. So you're talking, you're talking two hours just in the handle. Two hours of just milling. the handles. Um, yeah, so you think about it, it's a block of titanium, yeah. then we channel it out, you know, so we can put in all the internals, but yeah, it takes quite a while. Okay. Um, and then we complement it with an S30V blade and this crazy Warncliffe profile on it. Mm. So it looks strong. It does. It's incredibly strong, and you know it's one of those things. If you flip, you're going to drop your knife. It's going to hold up pretty well. Yeah. Uh, we also have ball bearing pivots in this guy, as well as a cool little technology piece with a latch. It's actually held, uh, actuated by a magnet. Okay. So most traditional ballets either just have uh, a spring. Mm -hmm. We've we've had spring latches before, but this one has no mechanical parts. It's just going to always be stays out of the way while you flip. Okay. So. Brilliant. That's the Benchmade Model 87. That's one of the big ones that we're excited for this year. Another one that we're excited for this year that I can just show you right here is the Presidio 2. So okay. the Presidio was always a knife that we've had and a lot of people who've done combat 
uh, or served in the military have probably used a AFO or a Presidio. Presidio has been a long tradition and heralded uh, combat knife. We retired the first one to introduce the second one. So this is the Presidio 2, and we've taken everything that people have qualms about and improved on that. So one of them was uh, blade to handle ratio. Everybody thought the handle was always, and it was, the handle was a little larger on the Presidio than relative to the blade. Okay. We tried to even that out a little bit by giving a little taller profile to the blade and just incredible ergonomics on this. Another uh, another feature that's uh, different on the Presidio 2 versus the 1 is the is the texturing that we put on. Mm, that's so, the, nice. so the texturing is still very tactile. It gives you a lot of good grip, but at the same time, it's not so aggressive that when you slip it in and out of your pocket daily, it's going to make your pocket look like it's exploded. Out, yeah. and ex you know. Um, another cool feature about this guy is just uh, we upgraded the steel. The original Presidio had 154 CM. This one has CPM S30V, so great all-round steel that's just that much better than 154. Mm. Uh, what about in the sort of maybe something that would be more applicable to the hunter? More applicable to the hunter. So i got to show you guys this one. This one, although not in our hunt class of knives, this is the 560 Freak. It is meant to be 560 the, Freak. Yes, F R E E K. Okay. We went back to went back to goofy spelling like from the <laughs> 90s. Um, but no, it's, but seriously, this knife is a freak in terms of what it can do and how much utility there is to it. Uh, I'm going to hand this to you so you can okay. at least feel the ergonomics on that knife. Oh, that's comfy. Very comfy. Uh, the Versaflex rubber also adds a lot of added comfort and grip to that knife. So extended use, of course, will help with fatigue. Um, it just makes a comfortable, comfortable knife. We've also complemented this with an S30B stainless steel blade and a really high bevel grind that uh, makes it a great slicer. Mm. So, and of course, features our axis lock, which is a great one-handed opening and closing mechanism. But uh, uh, sorry, how is the just describe how the blade is locked on this for the people? So listening? it's locked with our patented axis lock. Or uh, our ax, uh, you know, our trademark axis lock, I should say, um, that you pull back. So it's basically a, a steel bar that engages into the blade's tang mm -hmm. that holds the blade in place when locked open. And then to disengage it, you pull it out, so it clears the tang, and the blade just folds back in. So there's nothing. What if it's forward? There's no way for that blade to. to uh, no, the, it it can't. If if it's forward, I mean, when it's closed, you can still obviously open it. But once it's but once it's, it's, once it's open, open. Uh, the axis lock is actually one of the top strongest locking mechanisms on the market. Um, this one I can't remember the exact numbers on, but you can expect at least 800 inch-pounds of torque before that really? lock fails. Wow. No, that's absolutely tremendous. Thank you very much for walking us through a small selection yeah, of no uh, problem, the range that you've got here. And uh, yeah, thanks for coming on. Excellent. Thank you, Cheers. Byron. Thank you. Okay, we are over on the Swarovski stand with Christian, and he is going to go through what is uh, undoubtedly one of the biggest releases of the, the Eatwa show here, which is your new scope. So tell me about the concept of it, what it does, and how you use it. Yeah, nice to hear that you say it is one of the big innovations here on the fair. I think so too. It is a new rifle scope with a 5 to 25 by 52 optical system. And it looks like a classic rifle scope, but there is a lot of digital and electronic intelligence in it. So by pressing the measurement button here on the rifle scope, it measures immediately your shooting distance, your shooting angle, your temperature, and the actual air pressure and using these influence factors in combination with your individual ballistic data for calculating and projecting the aiming point immediately in your field of view. Hmm. And it's the first time you have the possibility to connect a rifle scope with your smartphone okay. and make all the settings very easy and very user-friendly via the smartphone. So you, you basically calibrate the scope to the trajectory of your own bullet? Yes. And just explain what happens in the reticle. For somebody looking through, you press the button, it tells you it's 382 meters, and what happens next? If you press the button and um, the measurement is done, you will get immediately an aiming point, which you can compare with an illuminated reticle, I would say. It is a dot with wind bars, left and right, and depending on your individual caliber and your um, measured distance, the the point or the aiming line is projected in the rifle scope where you have to aim. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it compensates automatically yeah. for you. Yeah. And it, it's a, is it a simple case of um, how, how do you program your actual bullet into this? Is it, is it a menu system? We have a new DS configurator app which you can download for in the Google Play Store or in the App Store. And there you can make all your individual ballistic settings 
uh, similar to our existing ballistic program, very easy and user-friendly via the smartphone. Mm -hmm. We've also a database in there, which means we have more than 3,700 different nodes mm -hmm. in the in the app, where you can select your 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 use your preferred one. Absolutely. And do we know how much this is roughly going to retail for in Europe? Uh, in Germany, is recommended retail price 3,890 euros. Okay, so yeah, for the, the guys in the UK, that's roughly off the top of my head, it's going to be like 3,400 or something like that pounds. Okay, still. Yeah. Uh, that's brilliant. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, talk, us, talk us through that. I think it's something that a lot of people are going to be looking at because it's, uh, it's an incredible piece of technology. And to be able to, with one press of the button, know exactly where you're aiming without having to do anything else is, is quite incredible. And the great benefit out in the field is you can be really focused on the essential, the game, and placing a precise shot. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. So we are on the, the Steiner stand with uh, Carlo, and you have in your hand a set of very compact range-finding binos. It's caught my eye actually on day one, so I was can just talk me through it. Are there, well, is there a new launch here at the show? It is, yes. Oh, brilliant. Exactly. We used to have a laser range finder before at Steiner, but right about now we just set up the whole series new. We call it LRF 1700. It means laser range finder and it measures up to 1700 meters, the it's laser inside. It is, definitely. And we're not allowed to take it further because for the civilian market it's not allowed, but for the military it would be. So you went as far as you could for the exactly. civilian market. What, what, what we are allowed to do. Uh, it's, it's very compact and lightweight. It only has 785 grams of weight. So very, very light, very compact. That's why we have the reason we only have a 30 millimeter objective diameter. Okay. That's the reason why. So eight times and 10 times magnification. Um, and the best thing, in my opinion, is the sports autofocus. It means usually you have like the, the focus wheel on your binoculars, but with that you focus it once for your eyes mm -hmm. and then it is crystal sharp, uh, crystal clear from uh, 20 to in meters to infinity. Mm -hmm. So you only focus it once and then you can measure all the time. It doesn't matter if you want to measure a target in 50 meters of, of range or let's say 1.5 kilometers. Just pick it up and look. Just pick it up, push it up, push the button and you have the, the measurement within a second. Okay. Simple as that. So simple as that. And the best thing is really the weight and the price point is at 1,899 euros. Okay, so that's going to be like 1,700 pounds. Uh, something I think you're like better I'm, in... I'm doing maybe, you yeah. know, my math is not 100%. I'm not paying some, in pounds like too often, but yeah, yeah, yeah. That, so that's about the, it. UK so it's lightweight, very compact, can hang it around your neck. You can also measure it with one hand because it's so lightweight, so mm. your arm won't get tired very, very fast. I mean, it must be, I, I don't know because I've not looked at a side-by-side -side comparison, sure. but I have used a lot of the other rangefinders on the market. Um, rangefinding binos, sorry, I should yeah. say. And it must be one of the most compact and light. I, uh, as far as we know, it's the most lightweight and compact okay, on I, the market. It, I think so. Yeah, yeah it is. That was it my is. impression. Yeah. Definitely it is. And mm. th that's our USP so far for that binoculars. Yeah, really, no, I think that it's probably going to catch a lot of people's eye, both with the price point and the size of it. Price point below 2,000 euros. You don't have a lot of binos, including laser rangefinder, under 2,000 euros. Mm. So, yeah. Pretty much. Thank you very much for your time. You're very welcome. Brilliant. Anything you else you're interested in, or? Um, well, I, I tell you what, actually. Um, why don't we just look at one of your rifle scopes? Because, uh, yeah, yeah, so if we sure. just quickly have a look at one of your rifle sure, scopes sure, because sure. it's it's a it's a name that people are becoming increasingly aware of. Certainly back you know back in the UK and okay. I guess over in stateside, but it's not a name that people have seen you know for the last 20 years. Although I know you've you've been there yeah, yeah. in the in the rifle scope space. Well, we, it's not we a just name started with knew. rifle scopes around seven years ago. Yeah. Actually, we were once we called ourselves the binocular specialist, mm. and then we were uh, bought by Beretta, mm -hmm. and then we started building uh, rifle scopes as well. Okay. So, uh, you're already on air? Yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so what we have here, we call it our 70 years edition. The reason for that is Steiner celebrates its 70th anniversary in 2017. <laughs> the company was actually founded by my grandfather in 1947. Mm -hmm. So we have our anniversary this year and that's why we just made a special edition of our best-selling rifle scope called the Night Hunter Extreme. Mm -hmm. And now we have the 70 years edition of the Night Hunter. Uh, it has a 94% light transmission, so you have a very bright, very clear image, even at dawn or even at night, depending on the light conditions. Yep. Um, we have a brand new illumination system included. And so that, this is on the on the like what would be the third turret. Exactly. And how, how does this? Uh, how, just explain to me how the illumination works and what, what it uh, lights it's, up. It's quite that. easy. You always have an, an off mode and then you have the another il illumination mode. On so the increment edge. Exactly, measure. exactly. And you have always an, an haptic feedback, so you have you can feel it when you turn it and it's, it's, it's quite easy to, to use and to handle. 
And uh, we also increase. Let's say increase. We we just made it cheaper. We have a better price point. So it starts at uh, 1,600 euros, depending on the scope, up to 1,800. Okay. So it's all uh, um, as well the price point below 2,000 euros. So with one of the best optics we've ever produced for rifle scopes. Mm. So that's why we call it our limited special edition. It will only be available in 2017. Okay, uh, and yeah, then yeah. You'll, you'll do a different model. Exactly, of... we will have okay. a, a brand new model next year, mm -hmm. so that's our model for 2017, and I can, can just recommend it to grab it as soon as possible, <laughs> because I'm pretty sure they won't be in stock for a long time. So so what what did you say that is uh, slightly different on the 70-year model that was... Uh, uh, we also the increased, the, uh, we also uh, made a new design for the turrets. As you can see, we have the old edition right here. Okay. We have kind of bigger... Can we take this off? Yeah. Is it different underneath? Yeah. Underneath the caps, okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll just, and uh, as you can see, the turrets just have a different design. Oh, okay. They they are just a little bit bigger, look a little bit more military, I would say. Yeah. And the new scope just has a slimmer, nicer design. Oh, okay, yeah, it's a bit sleeker. Uh, as yeah. you can see. Yeah. And that's what the people complained about at the old scope, so we tried to improve that and made a special edition out of that for 2017. And this is with one centimeter clip? Exactly. Perfect. Oh, that's absolutely fantastic. All right. Thank you very much for taking time. All right, Byron, thanks for coming by. Yeah, thank and you. Enjoy the rest of the Eva. I will. All right. So we are on the, the Blazer stand, and I've got uh, Robert here from Blazer looking at the new Blazer optics, which were launched at Shot Show, was it, Robert? Well, the Shot Show was the first time they sort of, sort of saw the light outside outside Germany. Yeah. Um, we launched them really at the Dortmund show, at the Jagd und Hund in Dortmund. Okay. And so, I mean, what are, what are we looking at here? This is a first for Blazer in terms of it's optics a first, with it's the Blazer a, brand. It's a first for Blazer to do their own optics. Um, just to clarify something, it's a standalone optic system. It's got. It's not something that is made for us by someone. Uh, the group, the the L and O group, under which Blaser is a member of, also acquired another company. They formed a company which is called the German Sport Optics GSO, which is a talent pool of optical specialists who are coming up with all sorts of ideas for optic solutions. Um, Minox are also false internet, they're also drawing the expertise from GSO, but they're both standalone optical systems. We are, so on the blouser side of things, we are looking at uh, four, four binoculars. We're looking at an 8x30, an 842, a 1042, and obviously the, the most obvious one for the German market, which is an 856, yeah, for the light with the highest, highest light transmission, yes. Mm -hmm. and in terms of how this sort of sits in the market and sort of price point when where we see this in, in the shops, what are we going to be sort of looking at? Yes, we're starting for the small one, 1,600 pounds to 1,950 pounds retail. The so there there we we've come in at the high end. We've come in the in the straight into the premium sector, in line with the rest of with the rest of our brand. Uh, we didn't go. We didn't want to go for the for the middle, so the lower end market. No, we come in. We want a high end, high end optical optical equipment that what sets them aside is that this was not made for let's make a binocular these are specifically made for hunters okay if we can sell some to the bird watchers as well great but this is not what the what the intention was this is um, a, a hunting binocular line that is purely going to be sold through our blaser network of shops so you're welcome if you're you know if you're that convinced the optics of them are absolutely fantastic but you know if it's what you want you have to go through a hunting shop and also to actually get a, to get a look at one of these so that's that's how it was built from the ground up as a hunting optic totally which there, is which in a binocular world is not uh, that common actually no not at all but uh, at, at at the end of the day what what blazer stands for is it's got hunting at its core this is what we work away from Adventure, outdoor, yes, that comes into it, but we're in a sense, we're looking at hunting and sporting equipment for shooters. So that's, and everything that springs thereof is with, built with that in mind. So what you'll find is that they're slightly heavier. Usually bird watchers try to go for a little bit more compact binoculars, which are very much on light, uh, focus on lights and um, picture, uh, color trueness, that sort of thing. This is not what they're made for. They're extremely robust. They can really punch in that league. They're not punching above their weight when we're saying, look, you, when you put them against the other the, the the big, big top optic, optic the, brands, the top yeah. optical brands. So they can hold their own. But also what I always find is that these binoculars that they're making are always trying to please everyone. These are not. These are trying to please hunters. These are trying to please hunters, which um, I think is a, is a bold statement. Mm -hmm. I think it's quite brave. 
but the thing is, the good thing is we don't have to make a living out of these. Yeah. These are an add-on to our portfolio that supplements what we do for, for our rifle and the other hardware. Yeah. So in a sense, we've got the luxury to make a product that adds rather than stands alone. Yeah, okay. No, I mean, that's great. I, I, was, uh, I was eager to see them when we arrived at EWA, having seen when they were actually being released, and it's, uh, it's nice to actually finally have my hands on it. Uh, if you've got another five minutes, I would very much like to speak about the Miles 98 range. Please, let's. Yeah, let's uh, walk over there. <clears throat> so the Miles 98 range, that is not new for this year. It's been around for uh, well, a, a couple of years now, but just, just talk me through it, because everybody knows Associates, Mal the Miles are name with the Miles 98, because it's so historic and so famous. But this is a, a modern look at that famous action. It is. On the whole, I think we have to go a little bit wider. Yes, we've got now a 98 standard action that's made again in-house. In a sense, we we use that for the whole range of Mauser to go back to its roots. If you look at the stand, it looks very much different from what it looked like last year. It was always, but it, it was time, I think, with the arrival of the 98 now, with 98 system, with the standard size action that we make again in-house, to press the reset button and actually have a good old think about what Mauser actually stands for. Mm -hmm. And again, it's, it's, I'm always saying don't be ashamed of where you come from. It's an historical fact. It might be nasty, but it's not. But if you're building this, let's just realize one thing. The 98s, they were a military action. So let's just live with that fact and just try not to dress it up in something that it isn't. And if you look at the stand, we've got, you know, the, the sandbags, we've got the ammo boxes, and pretty much this is where Mauser came from. It has evolved, it's become something else, but now we're capable of actually making a 98 action again for a price that is much more affordable than it used to when they were handmade. Also, with the new, with the new mounting system, it's got, it comes in the old shape, but that also means that we've got um, a much more versatile uh, means of mounting scopes on it yeah. without actually ruining and having to machine around the action. What's also, what now has happened, that if you look across the range, we're looking across three rifles now, and at yeah, first are. glance, <laughs> you we're looking the at the same thing. Yeah, yeah, we but it's very not. much are. I mean, I'm standing here, and we're standing in front of the M98. It's uh, an M12 next to an M03. And at, when you stand back, it's just, it's just Mauser. But until you start to look closer, you can see the difference in the model. Yeah, what you, what you have is a, a very utilitarian, very clean look. It's... It does what it says on the tin. We can dress around the edge a bit, but putting a little bit higher grade wood on it. But when you what you look at this product, it's it's not a shame to say that look, this is a bloke's rifle. Mm. It's a very nice bloke's rifle, but that is what it is. It's designed just to do. It's designed to it's, do a job and do it very well. It's designed to do a job. You can you can go up and go down a little bit, but again, it's just basically taking it back to that Mauser core value of absolute reliability, precision. But let's not kid around and just like look it's going to do it better than anything else but what it is it's 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 a real workhorse horse of a rifle that you can always know that you can rely on it and mm. this is what they've taken it back to and uh, having the the m98 here now what what is the sort of price range of the m98 for those people who are interested i mean let's look at it it's, it's still not a cheap rifle it's it retails at around seven and a half thousand euros in in its basic version, but the good thing is you've already got a tap for the mounts there. Go back two years ago, you couldn't get your hands on those of below 15,000 pounds, put the bounds on top, which were another 1,100 pounds for the swing-offs. Now for seven, for seven and a half, you're off with a set of cute, quick detachable scope mounts, which Mauser have developed, which is the Hexalog mount, and you've got an ultimate, very, very beautiful 98 true 98 rifle. And it is a very beautiful rifle. It for, is a very for those people rifle. who like that sort of tie to, to the, the historic lines, it, it is very much that. Well, you know me, Barry. <laughs> I, I, I don't usually get excited about wooden rifle. I'm, more, I'm pretty much a plastic kind of guy. The function. The, I'm, I'm all for function and precision and, and, and technology, but actually, that's a nice piece. There is something about it, I have to say. And, and of course, by virtue of the fact that you know, we, we kind of just touched on the different models, you now have something which is possibly possible to access for everyone. You've got something that is at the, the cheaper end of the Mauser spectrum, which, well, so you should be able to access a Mauser pretty much as anybody now, hopefully. Well, the, the, it, most people would say, what is this bloke talking about? It's seven and a half thousand euros, that's not out of reach. But if you look at how much you're spending mm. on your shooting and how many things you're changing out, um, I'm not that kind of person. I've got a very expensive rifle, but I've only got two. Mm -hmm. 
So you know, I've I've saved myself that process, and I'm just if you if that's what you what you're into, yeah. just save up, and it's it's an aspirational. Don't get me wrong; this is not a cheap rifle, but it's 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 within somebody's reach if you're willing to save yeah. up for it. And, and again, it should be sort of a sense of achievement when you finally put that into your cabinet. And I think it is. It suits that. What I personally really like about it, as opposed to some other cheaper 98 knockoffs, mm -hmm. it's got there is nothing cheap about it. If you really, if you know, if you just take that sound, yeah, just, I, yeah. it's awesome. just you know they've got that heavy clunk of a true steel action. There's nothing tinny. There's nothing cheap about it. This is how it was meant to be, and it's it's. I would say if you take an old equivalent again, it that they were always built on. I think this is now. It is finally with modern production methods. It is now as good as good as it's ever been, if not much better. Which is a, which is an amazing thing to say because many people, uh, many people see the old 98 as the sort of the pinnacle of, of action builds. But here you've taken something, you put modern machining in it, and you've made something which is more refined and, and better. Well, it's it's just by default we're we're now able to to, to machine to much fi finer tolerances. But again, um, it being a military. Action, action, you know, they weren't meant to be high precision. They were meant to work in any sort of environment. What you've got now is obviously you've got more of a bit of a luxurious pro product, much better machining methods, higher quality materials. So we can machine to much tighter tolerances, which takes it that notch higher, which is like, it's a little bit like shutting the car on a high class car. It's just clunks yeah. shut and there's no rattle there. Yeah. No, there, there is uh, certainly something about the, the throwback and forward of an M98, and you just demonstrated it beautifully yeah. there. No, Ro Robert, thank you so much for your time today. It's been great to be on the Mauser stand and the Blaser stand and everything else here, and uh, it does look great. We've got some some pictures and a little bit of video which we're going to put with uh, uh, some of the podcasts as well, so people will be able to have a chance to have a look. Thanks for coming by. Thank you very much. Thanks. Great. Thanks, for that, Robert. Okay, we are over on the Rigby stand with uh, Mark Newton of Rigby. A major launch of the Ewa show was the Highland Stalker. Just tell me about the concept, where it's come from. I mean, it's an amazing tie back to Rigby's origins here. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the the uh, if you go back a hundred, well, 120 years now, 1897, uh, Rigby were buying in seven by fifty sevens from Mauser, and they were they were uh, working on them and turning them into two seven five Rigbys, and that slowly developed over the next 30 or 40 years, and it became the original Highland stalking rifle. This is the birthplace of British deer stalking and perhaps even global deer stalking and we, we uh, you know we found over the last couple of years a lot of people asking for that caliber amongst others and wanting a smaller uh, lighter rifle for for, uh, for hunting in Europe and around the world and we um, and we've produced it and it's uh, it's available in five calibers and I think most exciting of all it's uh, it starts at six thousand four hundred and ninety five pounds it's I find it quite hard to fathom the idea that today you can buy a brand new Rigby for that kind of money. That's great. I mean, again, if you go, everything we've done at Rigby since we relaunched four years ago has been about um, going back to what John Rigby would have done himself. And, and you know, at that time, 1897 and 1898 with the Mauser 98 action, he uh, he was buying in, you know, parts from Mauser and producing uh, very good, affordable working, you know, ladies and gentlemen's working rifles. And the... Uh, uh, this is no different. Um, those rifles back then would have been about twenty pounds, and if you work that out in today's money, that's about six and a half thousand pounds. So that's so how you've done it. You've tried to keep it in line. We've tried to keep it in line with what it would have been, and it's a. I don't like to use the word investment with with rifles, but there's certainly something about this, uh, the name and um, and how it looks, um, that it's you know you're you're not when you buy it, your money isn't cut in half the moment you walk out the shop. No, certainly not, and it very much has not only uh, a classic look to it, but it feels it feels like a, a classic rifle. Yeah, it, it handles like a proper London stalking rifle, it, how exactly. it should. Yeah, that's it, exactly. the, the rounded grip, um, the, 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 the slight uh, foreend, um, the gun weighs about seven and a half pounds. Everybody who's picked it up here has said, wow, this feels like a shotgun. It does, um, it, it comes it, to the shoulder remarkably well. Definitely, I think uh, maybe maybe not clay pigeons, but you could certainly, <laughs> you know, high pheasant perhaps, but it's, uh, no, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great handling rifle. Um, it, it, it looks very traditionally rigby. You could spot it 50 meters away and it looks like you a rigby. absolutely could. And the interesting thing about this is you've actually brought it out in, in two different versions to fit 
two different types of people. Correct, yeah. I mean, the, the, we're the only gun maker in Britain that I'm aware of that offers a dedicated gentleman's version and a, gen, a dedicated ladies' version. So whilst there are, of course, many great Brit, uh, British um, and Indian um, uh, hunters, uh, Jim Corbett, uh, WD and Bell, they're all gentlemen of adventure. They're all, all, always uh, lots of ladies of adventure. You know, um, you've got uh, uh, you know the Queen has a 275 Herself, Rigby, yeah. and uh, you know, there were several other uh, very prominent ladies who enjoyed, and to this day, enjoy stalking in Scotland. So we've offered a, a lighter, shorter version of the. Um, um, of the, the gents, uh, gents rifle, it's got a shorter stock, it's got a rounded um, butt plate with what we call a lady's toe, so it just fits a little bit more comfortable in a lady's uh, um, shoulder. And um, I think, in fact, we've taken quite a few orders of those as well. Really? Yeah. No, that's fantastic. It is, uh, it's great to see the success of Rigby since you know, the sort of relaunch of the brand and uh, obviously the, the big game models are now moving on to the Highland Stalker. It's, it's been brilliant to watch that rise and staying so true to Rigby and, and the origins. And we can see that in this stand. It is a, quite a spectacular stand that we're sitting in right now with the leather sofas and the Rigby wallpaper and uh, the, the Highland Stalker film that you've going on. I think it, it really ties back to the, the honesty of, of the original uh, John Rigby rifles. Definitely. It, um you know, we, we, we pride ourselves on being on a ver uh, being a very relaxed, open door gun makers in London. Uh, people enjoy coming down and being able to meet the guys in the workshop. I think we're the, probably one of the only places where we make them at the back and sell them at the front. And the booth is no different. I mean, if you look around us now, there's probably a dozen people drinking Rigby whiskey yeah. and sort of enjoying the ambience of, the, the, of our sort of Rigby's Highland Sporting Lodge yeah. in Germany. <laughs> Um, just one other thing to, to touch on because uh, I, I, I couldn't not bring this up having walked past it and also seen that the video that, that came out of it is the elephant rifle that we yes. have sitting at the front here which is the most remarkable piece of art. Just talk me through the, that concept and actually making it a reality. I think like, um, like all great British uh, inventions and things, uh, it, it came up as an idea down the pub. And we, uh, it started off as a bit of a joke because the Rigby 450 calibre is our dedicated elephant cartridge. Um, and we, we, we thought to ourselves, well, it's Rigby's elephant gun. Why, why, why don't we do, why don't we incorporate some of, of what's on there, um, you know, on an elephant onto a rifle? And we, I think originally we did the, the bottom plate and it looked absolutely incredible. So the next minute we spoke to the engraver, can you do the bolt handle? The next minute it was the grip cap. And then we said, you know what? We're going to do this properly. We want the whole barrel action, every metal part, to be carved with this elephant, elephant skin. skin. And if you look at elephant skin, it's got tiny little sort of pores, little round circles, and each one of those is cut by hand on the elephant rifle. That's a 360-degree cut. It's not stamped on. And there's about a hundred thousand of those individual little circles. Hundred thousand. Hundred thousand. The other thing you'll notice is that the, the pattern is uh, totally unique. So as you f go over the folds of the gun the natural skin follows this so it's not repeated anywhere it really looks like somebody has wrapped elephant skin around the metal parts of the rifle it is one of the most remarkable pe remarkable pieces of metal work i think i've ever Thank seen you very much yeah. i think my, my favorite thing on there is the the got the rose gold which is sort of coming out of the um out of the the skin itself it's uh, it's been very cleverly done by tony maven Who's, uh, who's one of our engravers. I mean, how, how many hours were involved in just doing the engraving on that? You know? We estimate about 2,000 hours. 2,000 hours. He right. actually took three months off afterwards because it was just, <laughs> I think, after three years or two, two and a half years of engraving, it you know, drives you mad. Yeah, you'd had enough of engraving elephant skin. But we, yeah, I think so. And we, the thing we, at Rigby's, you know, we try and we do the very traditional stuff, but we also try and offer uh, these exciting, unique pieces. And we have some some pretty crazy stuff uh, in the workshop at the moment. I can't say anything more at the moment. Um, but uh, yeah, some, some cool stuff that you'll see in the, the months and years to come. And, and just to finally wrap up, because it's of particular interest uh, to me being a massive Corbett fan, was the Corbett rifle that you auctioned off. I mean, it's a great story, a great cause. Just tell our listeners what you did there and, and what the end result of that was. Well, that ties in very nicely with the Highland uh, Stalker that we have here. So that, it was really, I suppose, when we saw uh, that rifle sell for a quarter of a million dollars, it broke the world record for an auction rifle, raised a lot of money for, for a very good cause, conservation and hunters' rights. And we, um, 
we've, we've uh, you know, we built that over a, about an 18-month period for the World Heritage Series, um, and we, we did several f other sort of follow-up pieces in India. But we actually used Jim Corbett's original rifle in the development of the new Highland Stalker. If you look at it, there's a very striking resemblance. I'm um, seeing it. Yeah. We, we've we've modernised uh, a couple of pieces on there. Of course, um, Uncle Jim, as we call him at Rigby, uh, didn't have a scope, um, whereas the new Highland Stalker is designed for the sights and the scope. Um, so we put a higher comb on there, and of course, this is available in more calibers than the original rifles but uh, no it's that uh, was quite an, I mean, probably the highlights of my career standing on the stage at Safari Club when the hammer went down at two hundred and fifty thousand dollars it was like the Super Bowl or something but uh, in, in Did America the room erupt the room erupted four thousand people it got a standing ovation it's something uh, the, the, the boys and I at uh, Rigby's will never forget and just for those people who don't know the backstory, you made an exact replica. Yeah, it was the it was a uh, it, well it was it was uh, very closely based on the original rifle. Um, but whereas Uncle Jim's gun had um, you know it was a plain working rifle presented to him for killing the Champawat man eater in 1907. That particular man eater had killed a recorded 436 human beings. Um, so we took the the design of that rifle and then we just covered it with engraving. I mean the. It was one of these projects where I could say to the, 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 the guys in the workshop, okay, let's really unleash our creativity on this. What can we do that's totally, you know, unlike the elephant gun over there. And it, um, as big as you can dream. Big as you can dream. And we, we, we did it. And the interestingly, the gentleman, the lady and gentleman who bought it, Brian and Denise Welker, they're lovely people and very, very supportive of Rigby. And um, I believe Don, um, Denise has won the uh, Diana Award at um, Safari Club this year. Uh, they they ordered another one based on J. A. Hunter, so uh, oh, who's always, fantastic. yeah, who's a, who was another um, you know, big big Rigby customer, and um, you know um, for for everything he did in Kenya. Oh, amazing! Um, a great great story, Mark. It's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you today. Thank, thank you, you very, very much for coming on. That no, was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening. It was well. You had a lot of people speaking. There must have been ten over 10 guests on this show it was really good fun actually because yeah. uh for a good chunk of it uh daryl was busy doing some meetings and stuff and i just and taking pictures of the show that some of the pictures that we put up on our social media and i wandered around with the mic grabbing and collaring people that i i thought our listeners would find interesting and uh i think we we did manage to speak to a number of interesting people on a side note uh the youtube version of this podcast will be out it'll be slightly delayed it'll probably be out a few days after because we need to get back and because we're in the highlands the internet is running at about well let's put it this way i think uh two tin cans and some <laughs> string between it would be actually more beneficial uh so yeah it's impossible to upload videos here i, I I've, i'm fearful to even upload this show uh but yeah there is a number of guests that have been recorded. So Pedro and uh, we, well, I can't even remember actually. There's oh, we've got n more ones coming yeah, up so actually. So we had Phil last, uh, yeah. last time as well. Phil was the last one. And there's about four or five interviews that were on this show. They're also recorded that you can go and check out on YouTube as well. We'll also be breaking some of them onto individual little videos that we'll be putting on Facebook. So no, nobody can miss out. Uh, and the next show we will be bringing you again more interviews from iwa but there'll only be two two from iwa very interesting ones yes I and think. with a possibility of winning some real gucci stuff oh yeah so we, i think we can say who, who we've got coming yeah, on next yeah. so we've got uh we've got uh, marcus from garmin yeah and we've got uh, none other than the famous davy hughes from Swazi Clothing. incidentally uh marcus from garmin does talk about on the show um i need to Hopefully I remember this correctly. He does talk about a new Garmin device that's for safety for people that's out on the hill. We got a message only yesterday asking that exact question about uh, someone that I think they have an illness mm. and they are wanting information or if we knew anything about safety of devices that are not satellite phones or have a huge monthly contract cost. So actually that's and going to be one for them. Yeah, for one for them because I think Garmin might actually have something that fits your needs. I think it was literally just, just out, so uh, yeah. it was they were talking about it fresh at the show, so you'll be able to hear that in two weeks' time. Uh, do we... Oh, no, we'll tell you what you can win on the next show. The next show. Oh, no, we'll tell you. Don't want, just, yeah, don't want not to too many surprises for one much. day. Uh, but don't forget to enter the competition for uh, this month, which is... Uh, this month, this week, uh, which is to win a pair of Smith Optics shooting glasses.
Yep. And if you ever want to get in contact with the show, which many, many people do, it's podcast at paceproductionsuk.com. Uh, you can visit our website, thepacebrothers.com. It has loads of stuff there, including our blog. And I've not said this in a wee while because this is on multiple platforms. And just in case you're on a platform that you don't like right now, it is on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio. I think we're a way to try and get it on Google Play. It is also on YouTube, but YouTube's normally a bit delayed. So there's no excuse not to listen. At um, all. I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. For another two weeks, uh, this podcast is brought to you by the Scottish Association for Country Sports. Yeah.